Good morning, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Sengla from the University of Cincinnati, uh, the uh, Division of Pulmonary Critical Care. Uh, Dr. Sengla uh, had his MD, MD degree from India before coming to the U.S. and uh, did his residency and fellowship at the University of Cincinnati, completing it in 2017. Uh, his interest in academia was very evident uh, early on. Um, he was committed to that, um, had his uh, master's degree in uh, research and translational research uh, from the University of Cincinnati and joined the faculty at the University of Cincinnati, and he's one of the mentees with Dr. Um, um, McCormick, um, and you look at his CV and his accomplishment in a short three years, uh, it's outstanding, uh, three book chapters, uh, over 14 publications, and did a fantastic job. Um, talking with Dr. McCormick, he said that he's a rising star, and we were very happy to have him uh, visit us today, even if it's remotely, and uh, talk about uh, ILD for the internist. It's a important subject, a uh, lot of development in the field of ILD, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Singla will uh, uh, give us an overview of that. Uh, so uh, I want to thank him for taking time to chat with us, and uh, Dr. Singla, thank you, uh, and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Saad, for those kind words. Uh, so yeah, um, I'll uh, present uh, on this topic of interstitial lung disease, which is a very broad topic. So I'll be mainly talking about what an internal medicine uh, physician should know about interstitial lung diseases. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose for this talk. So starting about why, why are we talking about interstitial lung disease when we have pulmonologists out there, why do an internist need to know? Uh, a little bit about IRDs. Uh, so if we look at all the uh, diseases in the respiratory disease, uh, in, within the respiratory diseases, about 15% of the respiratory disease will come under the ILD category. And uh, about two thirds of these ILDs are actually of unknown etiology, which makes it a very challenging job. It's a group of disorders which has approximately more than 200 disorders, uh, if somebody has to count individual diseases. Uh, um, about, uh, in collective, uh, it's about one in a thousand population that uh, can get affected with interstitial lung disease. And these diseases are usually have a huge impact on patients' life. Uh, they can be very disabling with exertional dyspnea and cough, a lot of patients with ILD have a very impaired quality of life and poor survival, especially if the fibrosis is pre present. And there are a lot of dilemmas and challenges with the, di with the ILDs. Uh, first of all, it's difficult to di recognize and diagnose. Uh, most of the times there is a delay of more than one to two years after the symptom onset to establishing the diagnosis and starting treatment. Um, a lot of patients get a wrong diagnosis initially. It's a, I'm sorry. Um, it's a heterogeneous group of uh, uh, diseases with multiple mechanisms. And um, so far we still have limited treatment options, which is highly dependent on what stage the disease is. Uh, but we have much more treatment options than what we had about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, uh, ILD is a group of multiple diseases. Uh, I'll uh, uh, focus a little bit on uh, uh, IPF, which is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, as an example of uh, ILD, as it's one of the most common ILDs. Um, so the incidence of IPF in uh, US population, uh, this estimate is from 2011, was about three to 20 per 100,000 person year with a estimated prevalence of around 100 per 100,000 person year. But the prevalence really goes up as a, uh, uh, in older population. And then in this estimate around 500 per 100,000 
uh, people above the age of 65 have IPS. And there is a good chance this is an underestimate. Uh, this study was a population-based study where uh, they did CT scans on uh, around 2,600 uh, patients and found that there are some interstitial abnormalities present in about six to seven percent of the patients. And uh, there is TT evidence of lung fibrosis in up to two percent of the patients, which is a much higher population uh, than we previously anticipated. How many of these become clinically relevant over time, we do not know as yet. But I uh, this just tells us that as in this world where TTs are so common, um, there will be a lot of patients coming uh, to the general practitioner for with some abnormalities on the CT scan that might need for the evaluation. And uh, to make matters complex, when you see somebody with interstitial lung disease and you talk to a pulmonologist or a radiologist, they will come up with uh, some kind of a three-letter word. It's either IPF or ILD or IIPs or NSIP. There is a whole lot of alphabet soup of ILD, which makes it very confusing. Um, um, uh, so uh, it's important that uh, the internal medicine docs recognize what what uh, the subgroups of ILDs are and what they actually mean. So the main learning objectives for my talk would be, I will go briefly over the introduction and classification of ILDs. My main focus would be on evaluating a patient with interest. And then uh, I'll I have a couple of slides on uh, IPF and go over the treatment overviews of patients with ILD with recent progress in the last few years. So to know about uh, ILD, we first have to uh, just uh, uh, recall about the uh, pulmonary anatomy, uh, what pulmonary interstitium is. When we look at the lung anatomy and uh, follow the bronchioles to the terminal branches, it has alveolar sacs, and there are about a few alveolar sacs uh, in a, uh, covered by uh, a connective tissue, which is called as a secondary lobule, uh, which, has a supply, which, which is supplied by the arteries and the bronchioles. And this uh, pulmonary, uh, the pulmonary interstitium is the space between the alveolus and uh, the capillary endothelium. It's a very thin structure, and it's thin for a purpose that gas exchange has to happen. It does not have a lot of cells in it, uh, and uh, um, uh, yeah. Uh, so interstitial lung disease is basically non-malignant and non-infectious diseases of the lower respiratory tract, which is characterized by either inflammation or derangement of these alveolar walls. But it's a broad category where the disease can, can sometimes also involve the alveolar space as well as the terminal bronchioles. So interstitial lung disease, uh, there are some uh, diseases which will involve more of the alveolus or more of the terminal bronchioles uh, in pathology. Um, it's also sometimes uh, designated as a diffuse parenchymal lung disease. And it's a group of disorders of more than 200 diseases which have common and overlapping clinical, radiological, and physiological consequences, where basically uh, there is some inflammation or scarring of the interstitium leading to uh, impairment in gas exchange. There are various ways of classifying ILDs. Uh, we can classify it based on whether it's acute or chronic, whether based on etiology, whether it, we know the cause or unknown, based on the radiological pattern, uh, based on histopathology, or based on disease behavior. This is the uh, classification which the American Thoracic Society has proposed, and it's it, uh, this paper was out in 2002, and we still follow uh, this kind of classification um, where they put uh, ILD into make four major baskets. One is the diff uh, ILDs of known cause, such as associated with drugs or um, systemic diseases, 
Then comes a major group of idiopathic interstitial mm -hmm. pneumonias, where these are the ILDs, where we do not know the cause. Um, amongst these, there are many diseases, and IPF, or idiopathic and pulmonary fibrosis, is the most common idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, but there are other idiopathic interstitial pneumonias as well. Then comes the category of granulomatous diseases, where the main disease is sarcoidosis. And then there is a fourth uh, basket of interstitial lung diseases, where they put diseases which look a little different on CT scans. These are the uh, diseases which mainly cause cysts in the lung, such as lymphangiomyomatosis or pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Um, it's come. It's it's important to recognize. Uh, I've seen the uh, these terms being used interchangeably, like interstitial lung disease, IIPs, IPF. It's important to recognize that interstitial lung disease can be idiopathic or of known cause. Within the idiopathic uh, interstitial lung disease, there is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but there are other diseases other than idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis too. And pulmonary fibrosis can be seen in um, most patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but can also be seen in uh, other IIPs and other interstitial lung diseases of known cause too. So um, to use the correct terminology is important. I have had patients who come to me with the pulmonary fibrosis secondary to sarcoidosis, where they looked up online, they thought they had IPF, and they come to me uh, uh, looking at the net that their survival is about three years, uh, and uh, which causes a lot of distress to a lot of patients. Uh, as I thought, there are about uh, more than 200 ILDs, but if we look at the categories, four uh, groups of categories make a uh, majority of the patients with the ILDs. These are idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, interstitial lung diseases associated with connective tissue diseases, and sarcoidosis. And they have about the same prevalence. So if somebody is in your clinic with ILD, there is a good chance that uh, they will have one of these four categories of uh, ILDs. So evaluating a patient with ILD, the presentation can be with, uh, the patient can present with subacute or chronic cough or exertional dyspnea. And a lot of times patients are also presenting with interstitial findings seen on CT scans uh, done for other reasons. And evaluation will involve uh, taking a detailed history, some labs, lung function tests, CT scans, and considering bronchoscopy or lung biopsies. The foremost and very important part in the evaluation of interstitial lung disease is taking a detailed history and examination. It's basically to look if a patient has a secondary cause of ILD. We have to take a detailed history of the drugs and the medication the person has been exposed to, uh, exposures, any systemic disorders, and there are also some genetic variants of interstitial lung disease where the disease run in families. There is a huge list of drugs that can cause ILD, but uh, these drugs uh, uh, kind of compose more than 80 to 90 percent of the people uh, presenting with drug-induced ILDs. These includes mainly the cancer medications, especially chemotherapy such as bleomycin. Lately, the, with the increased use of checkpoint inhibitors, there is a lot of pneumonitis secondary to that too. Rheumatoid medications, especially methotrexate and anti-TNFs, can cause ILDs too. Amiodrone has been a big one in causing ILD. Uh, nitrofurantoin, uh, a lot of uh, patients who have been on nitrofurantoin for uh, recurrent UTIs can develop ILD. And this, there is a, there are many other medications, and that detailed list can be found on nemotox.com. Next comes the exposure history. It's important to 
uh, ask about any exposure to inorganic dust such as silica, asbestos, coal dust, and hard metals. And uh, these group of disease fall in the pneumoconiosis category. Um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis is an ILD which is uh, caused by exposure to more organic dust, the common ones being exposure to birds, molds, hot tubs, etc. Smoking history is very important. Uh, there are some uh, ILDs which are caused primarily from smoking. Uh, such as respiratory bronchiolitis or uh, uh, desquamative interstitial pneumonia. But there is also other diseases where uh, smoking may be a factor by increasing the odds. Uh, in multiple studies, it has been found that uh, history of smoking increased the odds of developing IPF by more than 50%. So that's very important to know and uh, counsel patient about. With the increased use of vaping, we have seen uh, patients having vaping-induced ILD, and radiation can also cause uh, fibrotic changes or ILD. Um, uh, another thing to uh, remember is there can be a long latency between the exposure and the development of ILD, so it's really important to dig into the remote past about all these exposures, which can result in an ILD. Next comes evaluation of a multi-system disease, which can has ILD as a part of it. The most common of that, uh, most common multi-system disease would be a connective tissue disease such as rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, myositis syndromes, uh, progress, lupus. Um, it's important to remember that patients might not come to you with a full-blown uh, a diagnosis of connective tissue disease. They might come with very subtle features of uh, connective tissue disease, but has not developed a full-blown interstitial lung disease. Or in a lot of patients, the lung manifestation could be the first presentation or the first sign uh, of an interstitial, uh, of an autoimmune process, and patients can develop other extrapulmonary symptoms later on. There is a increasing recognition of some uh, of a disease entity called as interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features. Um, uh, this is a, a etiology which is kind of more of a research tool at this time where people are presenting with some autoimmune features and some serologies which are positive but uh, do not have a full blown ILD. And, uh, where the treatment might be similar to other connective tissue diseases. Other systemic diseases that can uh, involve lungs are vasculitis, inflammatory bowel diseases, and sarcoidosis. So when a patient comes, it's very important that we uh, look carefully for any of the signs of interstitial lung diseases. It's very important to look at their hands that can give you very valuable information. Up on the left uh, upper uh, is a patient with the Raynaud's phenomenon where the hands and the fingers can turn blue or white on exposure to cold. Um, I had a patient uh, in my clinic the other day who came with a diagnosis of ILD but had sclerodectyly and when we looked at the labs, his ANA was positive and was diagnosed with scleroderma actually. Um, Anti-synthetase syndrome uh, are a group of syndromes where, uh, where ILD can be common and there can be some subtle skin manifestations or uh, muscle involvement. Uh, one of the most common uh, skin findings that we find it in them is the mechanic hands, which is mainly fissuring and cracking on the, of the fingertips. And then there is dermatomyositis where you can have uh, some rash involving the knuckles and the peri uh, peri uh, male area called as a Gotron sign. Um, serological evaluation becomes important in patients with ILD, especially if somebody uh, comes with an ILD of an unknown cause before labeling them idiopathic. As a general rule, we order ANA by immunofluorescence and rheumatoid factor as well as uh, anti-CCP in all patients before labeling them uh, idiopathic. Uh, other uh, 
autoimmune panels such as the myositis panels, the uh, anti-synthetase antibodies, the vasculitis labs can be ordered if there is suspicion for them for a particular ID. Pulmonary function test is important in uh, evaluation of uh, patients with ILD. Uh, just to give a general overview, the pulmonary function test involves three major test groups. One is the spirometry, where we look at the FVC, which is the air we move uh, in a single breath. Then comes the lung volumes, where we look at the total vo lung volume, including the residual volumes. And then there is diffusion, which uh, basically is an assessment on how well there is a gas exchange. In uh, patients with uh, ILD, the typical finding is a low diffusion. It's uh, usually our, um, we are taught that there is always restriction, but uh, it's important to remember that uh, lower vital capacity and total lung uh, capacity, which are signs of restriction, can be normal in early ILD, and uh, the only presentation can sometimes be low diffusion. Uh, so if somebody has a normal, does not have restriction on PFT, does, that does not mean that the patient does not have ILD. And they can also exhibit hypoxemia, especially exertional hypoxemia when we walk them. Not all patients will have a restrictive uh, physiology, um, and some patients, uh, some ILDs can have obstructive physiology, especially uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, sarcoidosis, constrictive bronchiolitis, or cystic lung disease. And there is this disease entity of where patients can develop both pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema called as a combined pulmonary uh, fibrosis and emphysema or CPFE, where we usually find normal spirometry and uh, total lung capacity. And the only defect, even in advanced cases, is uh, a low diffusion. Regarding further evaluation with imaging, X-rays are usually uh, very non-specific and may show some uh, bilateral basilar reticular abnormalities. Um, and the main go-to test is basically a CT scan. There are a lot of different kind of findings that it can be suggestive of ILD in a patient's. The most common being the reticulation, which is basically some fine thread uh, mesh-like uh, opacities in the lung. When these become big and uh, predominant, this is called as linear opacities. Honeycombing is when uh, is a sign of advanced fibrosis where there is reticulations and there is total destruction of the alveolar sacs, leading to some some clusters of cysts stacked upon each other. Um, the other uh, findings that can be suggestive of uh, ILD at times are ground glass opacity, which is just a fancy term for haziness. Uh, consolidation, which is more opaque than uh, ground glass opacity. Nodules, which are kind of like small spots on the lungs, uh, can be up to uh, three centimeters in size. Mosaic attenuation is labeled when we have areas of the lung which are uh, more uh, black than the other areas, suggesting that there are areas where, have, where there is air trapping, but this can also be seen in some patients with uh, pulmonary vascular diseases. And then there are some patients which can present with cysts, which is basically a thin-walled um, uh, lucent area of the lung, um, which are usually spherical uh, and have a well-defined margin. When ordering a CT scan, actually the high-resolution CT scan is the image of choice in the lung disease. In most institutes, including ours, if you were to order a CT scan, they will do a five millimeter cut. But in an HRCT scan, they do a much finer cuts to a tune of about one millimeter. You can see reconstruction algorithm giving very crisp images. We do not need any IV contrast. Uh, so uh, there is, we do not need to order a CT scan with contrast uh, 
in patients where we are suspecting interstitial lung disease. Um, and we also do prone imaging in some cases where it can be very helpful in differentiating early interstitial lung diseases from something like uh, atelectasis. Just to give you an example, the image down below, the left one is a normal CT scan, and the right one is a high resolution CT scan. And we can see the difference in the one on the left, we are not sure whether there is some ground glass opacities and how much of that is reticulation. But when we take a high resolution CT scan, we see that most of it is actually reticulations and ground glass opacity. This makes a big uh, difference in my evaluation um, as uh, there are, if, if we can get a confident diagnosis on HRCT, we might uh, be able to avoid the lung biopsy in these patients. So, common question for the internist is when, when do I order a high resolution CT scan? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, patients coming with dyspnea is very common in the primary care clinic setting, and it's, it's common and uh, right to first look for common diseases such as asthma, COPD, or heart diseases. But listen carefully for crackles in them. Listen carefully for in their basis of the lungs if they have any crackles. Examine their digits and joints to look for clubbing or any signs of autoimmune diseases. Get a PFT including the spirometry and diffusion. Get a, we, we usually order an X-ray in everyone who is coming with shortness of breath and if it shows some uh, interstitial abnormalities. And lastly, walk the patient. A lot of times, uh, evaluation at sitting is normal. It's when we walk them that we start to see the abnormalities. And if a patient starts to desaturate above, uh, if they drop their sats more than 3%, that's abnormal. So if any of these signs are present in a patient's coming with dyspnea, it's reasonable to go ahead and order a high-resolution CT scan to evaluate for ILD. Just giving you a background of uh, how things evolved in ILD, uh, before the 20th century, we really did not know much about the subgroups of ILD. We all knew that ILD is a group of uh, diseases where it's associated with a much poorer survival than expected. Um, in the 20th century, we started looking at the biopsies and started recognizing some patterns and based on the patterns, uh, there were some patterns which were associated with the more poor prognosis, such as the UIP pattern or the usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. And there were other patterns where the survival was not that bad. So when they used to biopsy these patients, the usual interstitial pneumonia was the most common pattern that, that they would see. This would be a pattern where they will see normal lung adjacent to a very scarred lung, where there is a focus of fibroblastic foci, link uh, fibroblast and collagen tissue, and it's right next to uh, a normal looking lung. Um, and the hallmark would be that there would not be too much inflammation in these uh, patients. With the advent of CT scan, we were able to uh, identify some of the typical features of UIP on CT scan too. This would be a subpleural reticular abnormalities, more in the basis uh, of the lung. Uh, traction bronchitis, where there is reticulations and the bronchi, instead of uh, becoming small and narrow, becomes wide open. Um, honeycombing, which is which I discussed uh, just before, is a sign of a end stage fibrosis, and there would be absence of other features such as ground glass opacities, nodules, etc. So, in patients where we found all these features, the probability of finding a UIP pattern on histopathology was almost 100%. So this is what we call as a definitive UIP pattern. And 
if we see this pattern, we really do not, if and it fulfills all the criteria, we really do not need a biopsy to further evaluate this patient. But things are not always this clear. There are other patterns too. There are patterns such as probable UIP where you have some features of UIP, but you do not see honeycombing. Uh, there are features, uh, there is indeterminate for UIP where you see some features of UIP, but uh, some other features too. And there are features which suggest an alternative diagnosis to UIP. Some examples are the non-specific interstitial pneumonia pattern where we see a lot of basilar ground glass and reticulation. And in compared to UIP, this is more of an inflammatory uh, interstitial lung disease. Organizing pneumonia where we can see consolidations on ground glass just looks like a multifocal pneumonia, but uh, this is something that persists and can sometimes be migratory on CT scans. And diffuse alveolar damage pattern where we see diffuse ground glass opacities and consolidations without any particular um, uh, a predilection towards uh, uh, bases or anything like that. These are just a few examples of some of these histological and radiological patterns, but there are many more. It's important to recognize that these are patterns. Um, and to establish a diagnosis, we have to club it with a cause. So the usual interstitial pneumonia, for example, can happen secondary to connective tissue disease, particularly RA, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and the CT scan and the biopsy might look not different from an idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But the diagnosis, if you have uh, RA, is RAILD and not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. UIP pattern can also happen in other things such as asbestosis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, or secondary to drugs. If we rule out all the causes and there is really no cause for the usual interstitial. Only then we call the patient as idiopathic. Similarly, for a non-specific interstitial pneumonia, it can happen secondary to connective tissue diseases or drugs. But if there is idiopathic, then idiopathic NSIP is a disease entity. Diffuse alveolar damage is, is something, if it happens secondary to a cause such as an infection, we call it actually ARDS, uh, which pretty much everyone knows. But if it happens without a cause, uh, then it's called as an acute interstitial. Similarly, organizing pneumonias can be secondary to infections, connective tissue, uh, eosinophilic pneumonias or drugs. And only if it is idiopathic, we call it cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. And it's important to to get that to the actual diagnosis because the prognosis might differ. This is a study which looked at UIP pattern secondary to connective tissue disease versus UIP secondary to IPF. And uh, patients with uh, connective tissue disease associated UIP did much better than patients with IPF. A common question comes is why don't we biopsy everyone? Uh, uh, who is presenting with the ILD to, to be certain about the diagnosis. It's important that to know that uh, on surgical lung biopsy, it will give you a pattern. It will not give you the disease. And the pattern can be missed in about 5% of the patients. There are patterns which are not very clear or unclassifiable. So sometimes even after doing the biopsy, you, we do not know what exactly is the cause of that. The other is um, there is an associated risk with, uh, with the lung biopsy. The mortality rate is about five, three to four uh, percent in, in a lung, surgical lung biopsy. It's more of a two to three percent in a, somebody with stable disease, but in patients with acute exacerbation of ILD or with risk factors, it can increase by 10 percent. Uh, risk is much more if a patient's diffusion is less. So before we subject a patient for a surgical lung biopsy, we have to have a fair, uh, uh, we, we need to look into the risks and benefits of 
there are some alternatives of surgical lung biopsies. Uh, uh, bronchoscopic alveolar lavage is usually nonspecific and does not give you a clear diagnosis, but it can sometimes narrow your differential. And it's also um, commonly involved where there is a differential of an infection um, before proceeding to the workup of ILD. Transbronchial lung biopsies are usually gives very small fragment of tissues, which are usually not very helpful in most cases of ILD can be helpful in establishing a diagnosis of some ILDs such as the sarcoidosis, but most of the fibrotic ILDs, it's not very helpful. Uh, in the last uh, decade, we have seen an advent of uh, increasing use of cryobiopsy where uh, they put a probe and uh, it has a cryoprobe where it will form an ice ball on the top of it when we freeze and when we pull, it pulls out a small uh, piece of lung tissue. Um, it has been shown that it has a diagnostic yield of 80% and a pneumothorax rate of around 10%. Uh, but the risk of mortality is, uh, is much uh, less than a surgical lung biopsy. So diagnosis of ILD uh, involves a collective effort to work by the clinician, the radiologist, and the pathologist. Um, one disease can have many different patterns. One pattern can be caused by many uh, different diseases. And there is a significant overlap in the clinical presentation, in the radiology, as well as the pathology, which makes it a challenging job to uh, diagnose ILD. So the gold standard of uh, diagnosing an ILD is actually a multidisciplinary conference between the clinician, the radiologist, and the pathologist in trying to come to a consensus diagnosis of what uh, uh, the ILD looks like on histopathology and cause, and then going to the diagnosis. Just a few slides of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis because that's uh, the most common idiopathic, pul uh, idiopathic uh, interstitial lung disease. Uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, the, the name suggests what it is. It's idiopathic, meaning it's uh, spontaneously occurring without any cause. It's pulmonary. It's a disease which is limited to lungs without any uh, much of extra pulmonary manifestation. And it's fibrosis, which is basically it has a UIP pattern either on the CT scan or the lung biopsy. It's important to know that IPF patients will always have UIP pattern, but all patients with UIP are not IPF. It's a disease which has a very variable course. Different people behave differently. Um, uh, there are some patients whose course can be stable, some uh, progress slowly, and some progress rapidly. Overall, it's a disease associated with a very poor prognosis with a median survival of about three years, which makes it much more worse than most cancers. And um, it's the five-year survival is only 20 to 30 per, uh, 30 percent after diagnosis. What makes it more difficult is that a lot of patients with uh, IPF can go into what we call as an acute exacerbation where there is a sudden deterioration in the ILD. And here you see a lot of ground glass and diffuse alveolar damage on top of uh, the existing ILD. Such exacerbations can also happen in other fibrotic ILDs. And this is a disease which, is, which has a grave prognosis. Um, it, it, it can happen in about 20 per 100 patient years. It's more than a 50% hospital mortality. Uh, median survival drops from years to months. And it, it has been reported that about half of the pay deaths in IPF actually happens after an acute exasm. Just a line about other common ILDs. Um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis can be in a chronic and a, and a fibrotic form or in a acute or a subacute form. The chronic, uh, uh, the, it's, it's related uh, to exposures uh, such as molds and birds, but a lot of time we are not able to find an exposure. Um, on the CT scan, the typical findings are it's more upper lobe 
uh, predominant and can have associated air trapping. Connective tissue disease ILDs have uh, a lot of extra pulmonary manifestations such as joint pains, skin thickenings, or Raynaud's. Um, on the CT scan, we can see uh, a lot of ground glass opacities. And the most common pattern is usually an SIP pattern. And the serologies can be really helpful in, uh, in the evaluation of CTD ILDs. Drug induced uh, ILDs, again, commonly after amiodarone, nitrofurantine, or chemotherapy, they also have more of ground glass capacities. Pneumoconiosis can present with fibrotic ILD, and main uh, uh, pointer would be a history. Sometimes uh, some subtle findings such as pleural plaques can be seen in asbestosis, which can point out that it's from asbestos. And then sarcoidosis, it's more of a perilymphatic nodules, and we can have a lot of extrapulmonary symptoms, uh, including rash or uh, renal calculi or uvi. Just an overview of the treatment options in ILD. It, it'll depend on the type of ILD a person has. Um, if it's related to exposure, such as hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, or smoking-related ILD, it's, the main goal is to eliminate the exposure leading to ILDs. Uh, some ILDs are responsive to anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressants. Uh, the main category of that would be the connective tissue diseases the ILDs, the sarcoidosis, idiopathic NSIP or organizing pneumonias. There are a few uh, diseases where we have a targeted therapy, such as mTOR inhibitors and lymphangioma. And the main question comes to the antifibrotics where there has been a lot of advancements in the last few years. And in the end, it's the lung transplant if, if, none of the, if, if there is no medication uh, option to reverse or stabilize them. The disease process. So what to expect? Uh, lung function is a very good uh, predictor of the disease codes. Um, so we can hope that uh, somebody can, uh, the ILD can be reversible or self-limited in, in certain cases. This can be uh, something like a smoking related ILD or an organizing pneumonia where we stop the exposure or treat with steroids and we hope to regain some of the lung function. Um, the other can be a situation where um, some degree of lung insult happens and then it can pursue a stable course. Uh, this could be an example. The example would be a radiation fibrosis where fibrosis happen and it's usually stable over time or a progressive irreversible disease where, uh, with potential for stabilization, such as some cases of fibrotic uh, NSIP, where after pursuing treatment, uh, we hope to stabilize the lung function, uh, though not to reverse it. And then uh, in a lot of uh, ILDs, there is a progressive course despite therapy. The prototype of that is IPF, but there are other diseases where there is a progressive course too. And with the use of antifibrotics, uh, what we have seen is that we can decrease the rate of progression. Um, it's important to know that these antifibrotics are actually decreasing the rate of progression. So it will not make a person feel better when we started, but the hope is that whatever decline that patient might experience in coming future, we, we tend to min, uh, decrease that and hope to um, give a person a better quality of life. So these medications are basically uh, more suited for early disease hopes. A major advancement in the last few years is a lot of diseases uh, a subgroup of uh, patients in a lot of other diseases such as hypersensitivity pneumonitis, even connective tissue disease, behave like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, where despite treatment, they will pursue a progressive course. Um, and here, a uh, recent advancement has been that the use of antifibrotics can also 
help them in the similar way as it does in IPA. So the two medi main medications uh, used as antifibrotics are perfenidone and entidinib. This was the landmark uh, studies published in 2014, where both drugs showed a decrease in the decline of the lung function. Um, and the gra there is no head-to-head -head comparison study, but uh, between the study, they looked similar. Um, and then uh, recently, there has been a study of using nintadenib in non-IPF progressive ILDs where it has been shown that it can have a similar effect such as IPF and it does not depend whether the underlying pattern was UIP or not, which is basically suggesting that sometimes just clubbing them with uh, uh, other, rather than splitting them uh, can be useful um, uh, in the treatment decisions um, and going forward. We have to be uh, uh, careful about the side effects. A lot of patients with uh, nintadenib and perfenidone can experience GI side effects, such as nausea, diarrhea, and vomiting. We have to monitor liver function tests when they are on them. Um, particular side effect of perfenidone is uh, photosensitivity and rash. And uh, nintadenib can cause some thromboembolic and bleeding complications. It's important for a general practitioner to know about this because I think more and more people will be put on these medications in the coming future. And besides um, medical management of these uh, uh, with antifibrotics and anti-inflammatories, it's important to take care of comorbidity. Patients with IPF can have a lot of comorbidities uh, which, which impact their survival. Uh, we have to be vigilant and uh, screen them for thromboembolisms, coronary artery diseases, depression, sleep apneas, acid reflux, cancers, and pulmonary hypertension. The management of IPF usually starts with disease-modifying therapies in the initial phase, um, enrollment in clinical trials if they are uh, eligible, uh, focus on smoking cessation and uh, vaccination. Once the disease uh, progresses, we need to, uh, to uh, make sure their oxygen uh, saturations are fine. Um, if they are desatting with walking, uh, supplemental oxygen can have some positive impact on their quality of life. Pulmonary rehabilitation, even though it does not affect the pulmonary function, uh, it can have a, a huge impact on dyspnea scores and quality of life. And if, if the disease is progressive, we have to have a whole lot of discussion whether a person can be a lung transplant candidate or um, uh, have to pursue palliative care options. My last slide is uh, about this. So in the disease course of an IPF patient, there is a lot of predisposition from genetic, um, patient's odds increases if they are smoking, uh, they have a long subclinical phase where they might have some ongoing dyspnea, which is slowly progressive, may have velcro crackles on examination, and then starts the onset of symptoms and diagnosis. So there is a big gap, big, big time period where they, these patients are actually seeing the primary care provider and not a pulmonologist. And it's important to be vigilant about these diagnoses because this is where the internal medicine folks can have a huge impact in diagnosing them early and uh, referring them uh, to the pulmonologist uh, and going forward. I'll end my presentation with some take home points. Um, ILDs are a group of parenchymal lung diseases characterized by inflammation and derangement of the alveolar walls. IPF is a severe and a fibrotic form of IPA, uh, uh, interstitial, uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. Early diagnosis is crucial. Um, it's, uh, the diagnosis is based on clinical plus HRCT, uh, and sometimes we have to pursue a lung biopsy. Uh, main is to look for 
ILD, and if you have suspicion, order an HRCT. Treatment options are limited, may involve limiting exposures, immunosuppressions, or antifibrotics. But uh, it's, it's important that we pursue them early on the disease course to have a meaningful impact on the patient's life. This I'll end my presentation and happy to take any questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Singla. And um, if anyone has a question, you can um, you can uh, unmute and ask, or if you would like to, um, or if you wanted to uh, type something in the chat area, please you can do it that do that there too. So uh, um, either way, just um, if you have a question for for Dr. for Dr. Singla, uh, go ahead. I have a question, please. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, thanks so much for your presentation. Very good presentation. I have actually two questions. Is one about the mesotrexate you mentioned in the introduction that the mesotrexate as a drug induced ILD, but actually uh, uh, you still believe in, in mesotrexate as a culprit in, in, um, Immunites because it's published just last year, uh, a mm -hmm. systematic review, a big systematic review actually about the mesotrexate and declared it. And they found even in more in more than three trials in CTD ILD that mesotrexate uh, decreased the progression of ILD. So mm -hmm. it was uh, like in, for centuries, or not for centuries, but for decades, mesotrexate was incriminated. But actually, after this. Um, this uh, it's considered the biggest it's published in rheumatology just on 2020 so i i don't know actually for patients who, who are on mesotrexate now with ctd ild um, it is it is not kind of recommended to switch them on something else but but the belief of as a cause of mesotrexate we find the patients is going back and forth between mesotrexate and other anti uh, immunosuppressant. Uh, what do you think about those patients? Yeah, you, you, you bring up a very good point, and uh, I probably need to update the slide. Uh, methotrexate uh, was thought to be a very a big cause of ILD because probably the data came from looking at the rheumatoid uh, arthritis patients, uh, but recent studies have clearly implicated that most likely those ILDs were not from methotrexate. Um, methotrexate can cause acute pneumonitis, uh, which is well established, but that's not very common. Um, and uh, there has been a frame shift in the management of rheumatoid arthritis ILD, where earlier we used to stop everyone who was on methotrexate and now it's more that if 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 somebody is on methotrexate, there is a good chance that it's not the cause. Um, and in in patients where ILD is is not that severe, at least you can continue the methotrexate. Again, these are a lot of these data is is not prospective, so that's where things are a little muddy. Uh, are not very really clear, but but I agree that methotrexate as a cause of a chronic fibrotic ILD, um, there has been a lot of changes in that thinking. Okay, thank you. Another also another question about the uh, anticoagulation with antifibrotic. Also, this is a, a challenging management. It is not absolute contraindication to use nintedanib with uh, comodin, but how you like those patients, would you put them on nintedanib or you exclude them or how you will manage patient with, for example, AFib on either the new, uh, the, 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 the majority of the oral or the warfarin itself, like it's not also, it's showing both, it's actually showing thrombotic events and increased bleeding tendency. So it's very difficult even like, to not to follow even the INR, it will not be a good, they can develop bleeding even with the INR with, with a normal. So it's a kind of, uh, uh, and also on the other side, you can't deprive them completely from the antifibrotic and saying, oh, the patient was on warfare because this is a chronic disease and it, most likely it will progress. So how would you deal with uh, 
anticoagulation and uh, antifibrotic in the same time? Yeah, this is this is a very good question. Uh, so one thing is uh, the, the the data on this uh, nintadenib induced VTEs and um, and uh, 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 bleeding complication. The risk was small, but was certainly more than the than the uh, placebo arm. Uh, and you know, a lot of patients with fibrotic lung diseases are actually older population who do have underlying predisposition to both embolism and bleeding. My usual take is I usually don't stop their nintadenib unless and until it becomes a huge problem. If if it becomes that you know there can be unmanageable complications, then uh, sometimes I discuss switching for, to aspirate, but I, so far I have not been, I, I did not need to do that. And you, the, the, diff, the more difficult is to start them. If a patient is like, um, to initiate them, uh, especially in a patient who have a bleeding tendency problem, like patient was in the ICU or in the hospital admitted with a bleeding from, mm -hmm from warfarin or comedin, and then she's coming in the outpatient clinic, and it was a real patient with me, and now I should start here on on nintedanib. So I kind of was reluctant because she had ex extensive GI bleeding up to the point that she's admitted to the hospital, and then they, it took them a while to starting again the warfarin for her. So. This is a this is a problem even to to restart it. Definitely, if they are on it, we will not stop it. But the problem right. is to, to restart from uh, with history of GI bleeding. Yeah, that that's a challenge. But uh, I think uh, once they're bleeding and or the clotting complication, whatever is happening, is stabilized, uh, you can have a discussion with the patient that this is something you you need to watch for. Um, and then then consider starting it yeah okay thank you so much i appreciate thank you dr sangla it was a pleasure uh, meeting you remotely and hopefully we are gonna get a chance to uh, um, invite you here in person uh, with very nice talk thank you very much and uh, best of luck thank you thank you have a good day thank you dr singla and before you go um i'm um, we have a little tradition here at U of L for our Grand Round speakers, and we we started several years ago when people were able to visit us, and we've continued it through the virtual world. But uh, a little tradition started by Jesse Roman a few years ago that uh, we uh, have a little gift for our Grand Round speakers. It's uh, very familiar with Louisville, so you will be getting your own Louisville Slugger bat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, congratulations, and uh, we'll get. I'll get that. I may. Um, I'll get that out uh, tomorrow. And uh, but uh, anyway, thank you again for such a great lecture and a great talk, and very timely and very pertinent. At uh, and uh, want to thank everybody who joined us. And, um, and Dr. Singla, thank you again. And um, if um, if you could email me, or you actually, I, I gave you my number yesterday. If you want to text me the preferred address where you would like your bat to be shipped to. Uh, you could do that, and I'll get it out uh, later today or tomorrow. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. and thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, we will be taking a break for the holidays, and we will be back on January sixth. And I believe uh, Dr. Dinesh Kalra from uh, our uh, Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine will be doing our presentation. And uh, we want to thank you everybody again. And again, thank you, Dr. Singlin. We we'll, we'll, we hope to see you down here soon. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and uh, happy holidays. We'll see you, see you in a couple of weeks.